Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me. Welcome to our, uh, our, our exploration of addiction with hypnotherapy and uh, preview of the course that we, we run. Um, just whilst we're waiting for one or two more people to, to join us, um, just to... Uh, uh, just to ask you, really, if you'd be kind enough to drop into the chat, just, you know, say hello and where <coughs> you're from. It's always nice to um, know what area of the world our, our, <coughs> uh, our delegates are, are from here. So it'd um, be wonderful if you can say hello in the chat. Um, and throughout the session, um, Charles and I, and I'll introduce Charles in a moment, I'll introduce myself in a moment. Um, and the other members of the team somewhere who are in the background here. Um, but uh, um, we will ask as we go through um, this uh, we go through this this session, if you want to ask a question, we do love questions. Um, be wonderful um, if you could drop the the questions into the chat and Charles and I will get to them at uh, the right time. But also, if you do want to speak to us as a human being and not a, a chat message, um, then if you use the raise hands, um, the raise hand facility um, at the bottom of your screens, uh, we'll see the hand come up and then we can at the right time just ask you to come in and ask your question. Um, let's say we do like questions. We've got an hour here, so uh, uh, hopefully it's going to be um, um, an interesting uh, an interesting hour for you. Um, we've also got in the background, we've got Julian and Shia who are running things, I'm sure, for us nicely and smoothly. And we will have Riska somewhere as well, who is our, uh, um, who's, who's, who's from our marketing team. And she will be dropping her information into the chat later um, for anyone who wants to ask about the courses themselves. Um, we'll get some more information. Um, and I can just see Risk is just, just joining us right now, uh, along with a couple of other people. Um, so first and foremost, let me introduce myself. My name is Peter Mabbott. I'm the um, head of academics for the LCCH, LCCH Asia Group. Um, my background is psychopharmacology. Um, so uh, uh, one of my earliest um, jobs, really, or in my early my first career, I uh, was actually looking at addiction to the group of drugs known as the benzodiazepines. Um, we're doing a lot of research into them and uh, quite proud to be a part of the, um, the team that first proved that they were addictive. Needless to say, Roche Products, who main um, a developer of these drugs didn't like us very much. Um, so I've always had an interest in, in addiction. Um, and, and I'd like to introduce Charles, my co-host um, uh, today. Um, Charles, um, Hello. introduce yourself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Hello. Good morning to all. Or good evening to some people. Good afternoon to some people. But here is morning. So uh, about me, I originally trained in psychoanalytic psychotherapy and I practiced it for so many years. And then I began to develop, well, interest in other therapies. And uh, what made me do that was mainly the length of time sometimes psychoanalytic psychotherapy took, like with phobias and things like that. So I I was... I started looking around. I was always kind of interested in hypnosis, although I never really trained in it. I've done a couple of seminars in the past, but that's all. So I decided to explore it further. Then trained in it with the LSCH, with LCCH, I mean, the old college. And then here I am uh, years later. Uh, like Peter, been, I've been teaching hypnotherapy for a long time, over 20 years, I think now. So it's been, a, it's been an, an interesting journey on its own. And I could spend more than one hour talking about that journey, what brought me to, hip, to hypnotherapy. Like Peter, I've got my special interest in hypnotherapy. 
uh, mine predominantly are to do more with the esoteric aspect of it, like past life in re past lives and, and regression. But I do the behavioral stuff as well. I, I describe myself as a GP with special interests, although I'm not a GP, I'm a therapist. So <laughs> that is me. Lovely, thank you. And and yes, you, you mentioned uh, 20 years plus. A long time, uh, I think it? back. I mean, time distortion only seems like yesterday. Um, yes, and yet it does. when I think about it, I, I started training in hypnotherapy towards the, uh, the beginning of the 1990s and became a therapist in the mid 90s. Um, so, uh, so suddenly seems quite a long way away. Um, so, but I'm sure as interesting as we are, I'm sure people here are wanting to hear more about the, um, um, the area of, of addiction that um, we're here to discuss. So um, what we're going to be doing is we'll be doing this in the form of a discussion. Um, and as I say, if you could, if you want to ask questions, then absolutely please do drop questions into the chat, do drop questions, use the raise hand facility um, as we go through. Um, and and um, Charles, let's, uh, oh, and the other thing is, if you could just make sure you have your microphones turned to silent and muted, just so that uh, we don't have the background sounds that are, might interrupt our um, discussion. Um, and also, um, um, Charles. Yes. Over to you. One quick question, really, or is it a quick question? Is the, re the relevance of training in, in addiction, and you know, especially nowadays? So that's the, the question. What is the relevance of training in addiction today, tra training to work with addiction today? Well, I think, I mean, it's from my perspective and from my perspective as a therapist, um, we're seeing uh, a rise in the levels of addiction um, that are coming through and there are probably several reasons for this one we've got greater understanding um, with regards to addiction what might have in the past I'm thinking of things like alcohol addiction um, might have become um, basically socially acceptable you went down the pub you got drunk um, several nights a week and nobody really thought anything of it whereas now people really do understand the physical aspect of it and the psychological aspect of it so we've got that element there there's the social acceptance of substance abuse um, we've also got the easy access to drugs that are out there today. Um, I don't know about you, certainly uh, I, within the UK, uh, my experience of people walk down any high street, um, and I'm not here to debate the, the rights and wrongs of, of drugs, we're here to talk about um, addiction levels, but you walk down any high street in the UK and, and you can smell cannabis, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have a huge problem uh, with nitrous oxide. Um, now, nitrous oxide is not addictive per se. Um, having had nitrous oxide in, in, when I was working with uh, uh, the dental unit in Guy St. Thomas's hospital, um, I was a, a subject for, um, for, for a demonstration. Uh, they gave me uh, nitrous oxide, and yeah, it's a very pleasant experience. But kids today are now abusing it. Um, nitrous oxide is dangerous, but there is easy access to that sort of drug. There is easy access to the the dance drugs that are out there, ecstasy, cocaine. Um, uh, all of these are much easier to get and economically easier to get you know you know when i first came into the field a tablet of ecstasy way back in the 90s cost something like 15 to 20 pounds which in the 90s was an awful lot of money nowadays um for a couple of pounds you can get what they pass off as ecstasy so it's economically easier to to access um and also what I find as well, 
when we're looking at the psychological areas that people are experiencing or the psychological each issues people are experiencing we have the internet you know I've, I've got a phone next to me i've got my attachment to the internet there we're talking via the internet people go on the internet nowadays to find information um and through that information, through, you know, people who might have psychological issues uh, um, or, or self-esteem issues or trauma-based issues, they're looking for strategies quite often through social media groups and so on. And so there is also that element that's there. And, you know, um, I know we've got somebody in, um, Andrew, who's uh, a school counsellor, uh, and it's through those types of areas that kids are also getting exposure um, to the drugs, which for some will lead them into an element of, of addiction um, that that's, uh, we're seeing. So there is that aspect, too. And we must never forget the where, one area that has always been, you know, I'm a child of the 60s, I was born in 1960. So I was coming into that era, um, you know, where everyone was kind of going into things like uh, uh, LSD and and all of that. Uh, not, I hasten to add me, I was, <laughs> as I say, I was only born in 1960. Um, but the what I'm talking about here is a rebellion. Um, and it's a natural part of teen being a teenager. Um, nowadays younger unfortunately the people rebel what's the one thing they rebel with drugs alcohol and the easier access to nitrous oxide uh you know when 1970s it was a big thing with sniffing glue um it was easy to get it was cheap it was economical and people would sniff glue and there's addiction problems there so the addiction issues are on the rise and we need more people to be able to to treat these, you know, and it's a global problem. Mm. Yes. So, Peter, what I'm thinking right now is, from what you said, is how then certain situations we've been facing lately, like the COVID, COVID mm. comes to my mind, and it certainly affected many people in many ways, economically, raising depression. How has it impacted addiction? Well, the one big thing that um, we noticed during lockdowns and um, MCOs and um, and the way we were all having to stay at home, one of the big drugs of addiction that uh, came to the forefront was alcohol. Mm. People were drinking more and more. Um, People also, you know, uh, drug dealers are very, very entrepreneurial uh, and they found ways of getting their drugs to people who, you know, there were part, people having parties um, and they were having drugs delivered to them. Um, I live in a small village um, in the middle of the countryside and we had issues with kids getting drugs and holding parties um, out in the fields. So it was the covid certainly gave a lot of access ironically to potential addiction people were coping with um boredom you know it's a coping strategy make yourself feel good pop a pill and drink some um, alcohol uh um so there's that, that that element that was there it was a coping strategy as well you know, now we're out of it, perhaps we don't remember the anxieties we had back then. Um, but people were very anxious about uh, about alcohol, uh, sorry, about COVID and, and what the impact of catching COVID would have, etc. So they used it there as a coping strategy. And, you know, in the early days, in the first days of, <clears throat> of the pandemic, with the terrible rise in deaths, in, we were seeing people with bereavement issues and not just a bereavement somebody you know love person loved one passing away is bad enough but we also had the double problem where people were not being able to essentially go and grieve properly by seeing their loved one being present with their loved one during their passing 
um, all of those elements that nowadays we, you know, we do take for, for granted, if you want to say that. Um, so people were using drugs, we, people were using certainly alcohol to, to cope um, with that. Um, and then there was the whole issue that was arising within the uh, within both the general population, but within the medical population. Um, we had two issues there. There was po post well, what became known as post COVID stress disorder or post pandemic stress disorder. Um, essentially, it was just another term for um, PTSD, uh, post traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, we all know that one of the issues, one of the big issues with people who are um, coping with PTSD is that they find an easy way to cope um, using drugs. And I've always thought it's very, very interesting. Um, you know, when you've got a disorder like PTSD, you dissociate, you split, your mind splits. Um, your brain, brain's going, hey, this is terrible, let's cut it off, I don't want to think about it, la la la, it doesn't exist, and it's still in there. And what people found was that as they hoped, as they um, uh, found a strategy to cope, they discover the dissociative drugs that are out there you know the drugs that people use to cope create dissociation so we've got the natural or the um uh the abnormal dissociation that comes from ptsd um and couple that with the dissociation that comes from taking drugs drugs are easier to do pop you know just drink some alcohol pop pill or whatever it might be sniff a line of coke um and bingo you've dissociated you're feeling good you're not having to think about anything and so we had that going on as well people with post-covid stress disorder but also people with burnout you know people at the front lines were burning out um still are burning out um and drugs become a coping strategy for that really um that's one of the uh the main elements um, that I've also been seeing with with our frontline workers. So talking about hypnotherapy then, Peter, we both are hypnotherapists ourselves. Would you say that hypnotherapy is a useful tool to help people who are presenting with addiction? Uh, definitely. Um, you know, there is plenty of research out there showing its efficacy within uh, the treatment of addiction. We have to put it into a context as well. Um, you know, for yeah, for for I don't like using the word simple, but simple addictions like smoking and so on, it's a great tool that does help um, people take control and get rid of their smoking habits. For people who are uh, dealing with drinking issues that aren't overtly addictive, then yes, again, it's a great tool. Um, but also when we place it within the context of working with other agencies, it becomes a really um, effective tool in its own right within this integrative approach. Because we've got to remember that, you know, if you're taking a drug of addiction, an addictive drug, and I'm now going to be bringing in alcohol in this, um, if you are really severely uh, addicted to alcohol or cocaine or heroin um, or any of the others uh, that are physiologically addictive, you can't just come off it. Um, you know, um, if you suddenly stop drinking, you have issues with seizures, you have issues with dying basically um so many people need to be going through um medical um medical um supervision as they're coming off the medical profession needs to help them bring you know titrate down uh, they might have to go to hospital be stated you know all sorts of elements that that, that that can be brought in with that but hypnotherapy is excellent in certain ways pre deciding to deal with your addiction um uh um be doing um uh, you know deciding right i'm going to come off this drug hypnotherapy can help to 
the client build resources, help the client um, build the motivation and the strength to go through that process. You know, withdrawal is not pleasant, um, which is one of the reasons why people remain addicted to to drugs. Um, you know, we, so you've got that element there. You've got the withdrawal phase where hypnotherapy can come in and be used to maintain motivation, can be used, as we know, with hypnosis, uh, is very good at helping people deal with things like pain and physical sensations. Um, um, so we would use elements within that. Also within the addiction, we've got the post-addiction element. You know, there are many really good um, clinics out there that help people get off. Unfortunately, they're, they're put back into their normal environment and they're all around them. There's the drug seeking cues. Um, so you go into a place and you walk past the pub and that cue, even though you've come off, boom, behavioral element comes in and suddenly you're in the pub with a pint. Um, you've got people who are trying to say to you, oh, come on, you know, uh, let's go out for a drink bang, you go out for a drink, you've got the dealers contacting you because the last thing a dealer wants to do is lose it, uh, lose their customer. So they contact you with these wonderful, oh, we'll give you some free beers and all of that, bang, you're back in. So hypnotherapy is excellent in helping deal with that element of it as well. Um, uh, yes, there are the physical consequences and we have that. There are the behavioral elements that I've kind of alluded to there. So helping challenge um, different um, um, conditioned responses, these, these cues, these triggers in the environment, the triggers in their mind, um, helping to do that. Also, we can't forget, you know, dipping into your realm, um, the psychodynamic aspects, psychoanalytic aspects of addiction. People, yes, people do kind of get addicted just because they do that and it's been building up and then the physiological element comes in. You know, we've got to remember people take drugs be primarily because they're fun. Um, you know, people wouldn't continue if they took a drug and they had a terrible time. Um, they're not going to go back and do it. And before anyone says, what about heroin? You take heroin and you throw up. Um, well, then one of the things that heroin does, you know, you could be spewing your guts out all over the place, um, basically diarrhea dripping down your legs. Um, and but the, um, the one of the things heroin does is it suppresses the distaste for that. So that part of you that would be saying, oh, God, this is awful. Um, it doesn't. It, doesn't register it's suppressing that and so they get you know a heroin hit is apparently um like having the best orgasm you've ever had in your life um and that's what people chase after so you've got those those elements there so that that you know, people can get addicted because of the behavioral aspect but we mustn't forget that many people choose to go to drugs because they have underlying psychological issues, a wide variety of issues from bereavement, PTSD, or you know, as, as coping strategies um, for weight management as well. You know, uh, ad, ad, um, amphetamine drugs used to be very common in helping people get off uh, or, or lose weight because the amphetamines, the stimulants, reduce appetite, and so you don't want to eat. Um, so lot, and that's where hypnotherapy comes in as well. You go in, you can work with the underlying issues that are there. Um, it's not a you know one or two sessions, yes, with smoking cessation and very simple drinking. Yeah, you, you, you kind of got that, that, and that's okay. But where it's much more um, in depth and much more entrenched, then you've got a, quite a lot of work that needs to be carried out within that. And hypnotherapy um, uh, is, is a really great tool to use. Um, other approaches that are out there, counselling approaches, 
Um, I, you know, I also, you know, Charles and I also practice EMDR and, and ego state therapies. They are excellent approaches to use within helping people overcome these. So it can be something in its own right within hypnotherapy to help here, but also we can bring in other psychotherapies in a much more integrative way with regard to that. Um, uh, uh, and we've got a question here. What are the hypnotherapy strategies for treating addiction? Um, should we do age regression after induction or are there better techniques? Depends. It depends, Gary, what, what, what the client is presenting with. We never really do analytical work. First off, what we have to do is stabilize the client, uh, ensure they've got the emotional strategies, the um, strategies to be able to cope um, with the process that they're going to be going through. Then we would look at um, the withdrawal element of it. Once the withdrawal element of it's there, then we would perhaps have to be going down to using psychodynamic techniques um, to helping people. Um, uh, and um, yes, we talk about um, you know, saying plant suggestions during altered consciousness to replace the current addictions. Um, well, the suggestions depend on very much on what the inner self talk is, where the client's triggers are coming from with regards to that. So, yes, we do use standard direct suggestions for deconditioning, standard direct suggestions and to help change behavior. Um, so soon as suggestions and everything else. Um, uh, Charles, have you got anything you want to add to what to what I've just said? No, I think I think uh, I, 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 I something with, with respect to the, to the regression. Yes, you you wouldn't go straight away into it. You need mm -hmm. to uh, because of what you just said, the physiological aspects of it. You can't just look at the cause of addiction without working with the rest of it. So I I, I wouldn't go launch straight there. Yeah. Also, one of the issues that that you might get if you go straight in with regression and you uncover something traumatic or upsetting, which um, yeah, and, and if the client has not got the coping strategies, they'll go to their existing coping strategies, which right. will be the drugs. That's right. So, I, I wouldn't be doing it first thing anyway. You have to prepare the patient before and i'm thinking of the protocol of therapy uh, <laughs> you know that, that you, you don't you don't launch into therapy straight away you've got to make sure this person has got the resources to do the therapy the stabilization mm. that is the, the, the stabilization stage but peter right now you've been we've been talking predominantly i think about substance abuse alcohol mm. uh, and 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 the like lsd you name it we've been mentioning it it, it it kind of focuses on substance abuse but is there any kind of addiction that isn't to do with substance abuse that people come for <laughs> therapy to well i can give you the list of addictions that i've worked with and you know with the course that we 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 teach we do um, look at strategies for dealing with many of these. So the things like, you know, we're, we're living in a day in a day and age um, where everyone is kind of looking to get fit and get healthy and there's a big emphasis, and rightly so on that. The trouble is when we do things like exercise, sometimes with exercise, we stimulate the encephalins and the endorphins um, and the natural steroids and opiates within our body to the extent that people become physiologically addicted to exercise itself. You see withdrawal syndromes. We also see things like in um, porn addiction, addiction to porn. Um, you know, people going on to nowadays the internet and the internet itself it be, can become an addiction as well. But you so there's research that demonstrates now that people who are addicted to pornography on the internet have exactly the same brain changes with regard to dopamine that you see with people who are addicted to cocaine. Um, so internet porn, it does bring in those changes. I say there's also the internet. There's also social media 
Um, there used to be something, I don't know if it's still there, because in the early days of Facebook, there was something called FAS, Facebook Addiction Syndrome, um, where people had to be on the internet all the time watching what's going on out there now people have things like instagram um which i'm just slowly starting to embrace um but having to put their life out there and present their life in a particular way and they are addicted to being that it's creating the same issues we get with addiction um telephones having a telephone with you people show and demonstrate withdrawal syndrome if they leave their phones alone you know look around you when you go out today look at yourselves um look i've got two phones next to me hey well they're not showing up on my screen there i've got two phones um i i like to think i'm quite in control of them but look around you everyone has one of these wretched things in their hands all the time everyone's looking at them and look how disturbed some people are if they don't find their phone they don't know they put the phone down can't find it and it's not necessarily about the financial aspects because phones are expensive it's that withdrawal from being connected to the world out there that comes in um so that's an element of food um, is also an addiction um certainly when food is being used as a coping strategy to help with people um uh, overcome traumatic experiences and so on um shopping going out and shopping i am a work with people who basically will go online and they to help themselves feel good to calm down to have build their self-esteem they shop and they get a buzz out of doing that and then they get the trauma traumatic aspect of then realizing how much they've spent and having to send things back but they go into withdrawal if they don't do that shopping mm -hmm. um gambling addiction huge thing that's out there a one that people don't talk about um very often we have to be aware of it as therapists is relationships um, addictions within relationships, codependencies that occur within that, and codependent relationships that then promote a codependency with drug abuse. Um, there's that element that that we also see, and one that really people don't um, don't understand is addiction to abusive relationships. Um, you know, it's all very well and good looking into a relationship and saying to people, um, hey, um, uh, you know, just get out, leave that person, go and find somebody else. And then the next thing you find that they're back there. There is a neurological change when you whenever you're in a relationship. The reason relationships hurt when you split up is because you've got a neurological change to occurs there is oxytocin that floods us um we see oxytocin being released you know if anybody uh um takes an ecstasy tablet you've got the serotonin and then oxytocin the nerve hormone as they call it which is why people on um ecstasy are all bouncing around going love you love you you're my best friend oh i've just known you for two seconds and we're going to be friends forever <clears throat> that's coming out this insidious element here as well um, is um, uh, that within abusive relationships, one of the things that pulls people back is this bonding that comes, you know, when you fall in love, when you see a baby, when you, you know, give birth to a baby as a parent, you see your baby, oxytocin is there, you know, minutes before you give a woman gives birth her system is flooded with oxytocin um and it's one of my old research things i used to hang around outside the birthing wards um have to go running in just before a woman was giving birth um with permission of course um take a syringe full of blood because her blood would be full of oxytocin um we're using it as part of one of our research projects um, so you bind, you get bound with oxytocin and dopamine. The dopamine reward system comes in uh, because of the behavior of the um, uh, of the abusive person. And you get that 
with you get that that addiction so to speak with withdrawal i will never forget a client of mine i was working with had a very long story sure you know she was in an abusive relationship she got out of the abusive relationship found mr perfect mr wonderful um and that was it happy ever after so i thought until about a year and a half later, she came back to see me for something straightforward, like nail biting or something like that. And, you know, just so as to, so how have, thing, uh, how have things been since I lost, saw you a year and a half ago? Um, last time I saw you, you were with Mr. Wonderful. Uh, and she said, oh, well, that, that's great, but that didn't last. And I said, oh, so are you seeing anybody else? And she said, yes, I'm back with the person who literally hospitalised her on a couple of occasions. And so keeping my face totally neutral inside I'm going what um keeping my face totally neutral I asked her oh, that's interesting do you want to talk a little bit about that and she said Mr Wonderful you know everything was there he was, he was great but he was boring but with this other person there is the excitement the relationship is exciting and so she bonded in to the excitement within that um so there's that element there as well. So um, lots of different areas that are in there. I've just seen a message in from Kimberly. You mentioned that it's a coping strategy for many external reasons. I was wondering what if it's due to physical injury? Does that also mean it's also a form of coping due to the injury itself? Yes. Um, look at half of Hollywood um, and people who have had issues with drugs and you know, from what we're understanding, people like Michael Jackson um, became addicted to painkillers. So people can become addicted to to um, uh, drugs, of, what would be considered drugs of abuse, not because they're wanting to um, get high, but because they're wanting to manage their pain. You know, what is heroin? It's an opiate. What are opiates used? They're used to bring pain down. Or oh, a huge amount of research going on with regards to cannabis at the moment. Um, um, Delta 98C, the active ingredient within that. Um, you know, you've got you, cannabis is great at managing pain. Cannabis is great at managing a whole host of of different things. Unfortunately, with cannabis, you take cannabis. Depending on what style, type of cannabis you're taking, um, the pure cannabis that hasn't been genetically altered is not addictive in its own right. It's the rolling it with um, tobacco that makes it addictive, but you get psychological addiction. I can't cope with my pain without having cannabis. Um, uh, and and but the you know, skunk and and the genetically altered ones they're all they they are physiologically addictive um so you've got that element there of people are really really going into uh understanding um hey guess what um um I've, i'm using this and now i can't get off it so yes very much so um all right an interesting one from a uh, Yumi saying eating disorders are not addiction. Eating disorders have very strong underlying behavioral and psychodynamic elements um, within that. Um, so, um, uh, and Kimberly's also saying, I generally believe anyone can be addicted to just about anything. Yep. Um, there is no real fine line. The moment you get the dopamine reward systems coming in uh then you know dopamine reward don't get me wrong it's, it's great um in bonding in a healthy way and you know um i love doctor who uh, my dopamine reward systems kick in every time doctor who comes on and i'm drawn to it healthy and fun but if it becomes problematic gaming addictions you know, that can become problematic. Yes, nowadays anything can be addictive. Charles? Yes, no, uh, uh, but I agree with that. You can become addicted to anything, clearly. Yes. <laughs> okay, if you can't do without it, then of course, then we're talking about how addicted are you to the situation, to whatever you're addicted to, if you can't, if, if, yes. if you have to totally. have it, you know. But 
I'm noticing, Peter, maybe it's a change of subject a bit, or is, or is it? I don't know. Because the, the course itself, the Addictive Behaviors and Psychological Pain course itself, uh, goes to talk about bereavement and loss and indeed terminal illness, uh, which are interesting subjects, certainly uh, uh, things that one, that one we as therapists work with. But why are, what is the cause relating this to addiction? Uh, so quite simply because the when you look at things like bereavement and loss and the extremes of coping in there, um, you know, we've seen it with COVID, we saw it before COVID, we're now seeing it with the terrible things that are happening with people coming out of the Ukraine and various other areas in the world where um, uh, conflict situations are occurring that through the bereavement um, uh, that they're experiencing, they're using drugs as a coping strategy, mm -hmm. not the only coping strategy, um, but drugs are being used, again, because of how easy to get hold of they are. Um, and in certain cultures, alcohol has always been uh, a drug of coping. Um, and I've got a Roman Catholic background. What do we do when someone has died? Um, we have a wake and there's lots of alcohol around. Um, uh, and again, I'm not demonizing anything, you know, there can be in those situations a an in inverted commas healthy um uh, element of that. But it's when it becomes unhealthy, you know, understanding the whole bereavement process, um, understanding you know, what's happening with somebody who is going through um, uh, the end of life experience in terminal illness. Um, the person themselves might turn to drugs. Family members might turn to, to drugs. Um, I've worked with people who have had a bereavement through Alzheimer's. Um, I've got a family member who has Alzheimer's. They're still physically alive but they're coping with the death of the personality of that person and so the way to cope they do things like that um they look at the drugs so there's, there's that element there as well um uh so yeah that, that's one of the reasons why we bring that in that's interesting yes but also the course makes references to ADD and ADHD. So I'm wondering why is that? Why, why bring in ADD and ADHD into it? Um, again, here it is a case of looking at the two areas with ADD, ADHD, and we pretend to refer more to it as ADHD nowadays. Um, one, um, for certain people with ADHD, drugs of abuse can be a coping strategy. Um, you know, I know, you know, um, cannabis can be one. The one thing we've got to understand, we, it's quite interesting, ADHD, the prefrontal cortex for people with ADHD, is understimulated, um, which makes them hyper. So something that stimulates, so stimulant drugs, um, Ritalin, hello, um, they, Ritalin is a stimulant drug. Ritalin is also out there as a drug of abuse. So people with ADHD have you know, a potential for stepping into drugs of abuse. And it's useful for therapists to understand that element, but also thinking about, and again, schools and so on, um, smart drugs, um, these so-called smart drugs that are stimulant drugs that um, college students um people studying take coming up to exams which keep them focused which keep them awake which can be bought from people with adhd because they're taking ritalin um that's what some of these smart drugs are about so it's putting that into into a context here all oh, right right okay and is peter is the course just for hypnotherapists if we can 
this course is um and you know in a moment I'll, I'll i'll kind of take you through um what we're doing on this course so one of the reasons why this course is just for hypnotherapists is it builds on existing hypnotherapy knowledge and skills um it also has new stuff that we bring in which i'll, I'll, I'll share in a minute um but um uh, but yes it, it is purely for people who have some training in, or have training in 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 hypnotherapy uh -huh. and are qualified in it so it's it's advanced stuff and she's put in a question here is it more effective to treat the underlying psychological issues if there are any um first before working on the addictions problem an interesting conundrum what comes first the chicken or the egg um one of the things as a therapist what i will do is i will take my client and look at their individual need at that particular time if they're ready to deal with the underlying issue you know we'll the whole thing is stabilizing yes and then we will look at the underlying issue deal with that and then move into um uh the addiction but quite often you find the client presents with the addiction first they want to get rid of the addiction so as you're working with them going through the removing the addiction away from them you're also then starting to bring in the more psychodynamic work. So this is where, you know, we're saying I might use regressive techniques. I might bring in EMDR. I might bring in ego state therapy, uh, internal family systems therapy, those sorts of techniques um, in order to deal with that underlying element there. Um, it, it is, it's a challenge. And that's, again, why it's not just a case of going in and doing an ABCD of this is how you treat them. Every single person with a substance issue or an addiction issue from other elements is an individual. And you really have to look at them in that element, in that, that, that respect. We've got to place the person in their life place that person um in their understanding of their issues and then move on help them to move on in the way that they want to go through uh obviously if i really feel with a client who say i want to get rid of my drugs and i feel clinically that it might be better to deal with the underlying issue before we remove the drugs we may have a conversation about that it would be done through basically informed consent and if my client really didn't want to then i would stick with what my client wants um okay. there's strategies there so um so yes so peter the, uh, so what techniques are included what what techniques will this uh, use then okay let me just share my screen um a short powerpoint that i want to um uh use here um so basically um uh what we're looking at here is when we're working or the course basically introduce we talk about background and the nature of the symptoms um that we're working with or we're potentially going to be working with um so we've got that element being explored there but we're also looking at each particular presenting issue within addiction in the context of existing knowledge because you know we've got a wonderful toolbox already as therapists when we come into this but also bringing in the new approaches that um, we teach on the um, on the course um with regard to this so we've got that's part of what we're um, we're presenting here. Um, also, um, we are looking at a good variety of techniques. First and foremost, we've got advanced dissociative techniques that um, uh, that we we bring into this. So something called apposition of opposites, which again, some of you may have heard it referred to as mirroring hands. It's basically, it's, it's it comes from Ericksonian hypnotherapy um it's very dissociative it uses hand levitation um it uses parts dissociation um to bring about a balance 
Um, it's very unconscious in in the way and the way we use it. Um, so you've got the apposition of opposites or mirroring hands approach within it. The thing called mind body dissociation, which is a wide variety of approaches, uh, uh, uses rather, um, not to scare anybody, but I, I kind of refer to it as almost like a psychological decapitation. It's an approach that we teach whereby you hypnotize and deepen the mind and the body, take them down to quite a deep um, state. And then you waken the mind, but deepen the body. So you've got somebody who is alert in their mind, but their body is in deep hypnosis, which is very useful in a, a variety of different th ways. You know, working with um, terminally ill people who are undergoing intense pain, um, working with people who are going through withdrawal, so we can give them a um, physical, re remove them phys physically from that, um, the feelings that they've got there. People who 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 find that their physical, the physical effects of what they're experiencing is interfering with their cognitions, it helps them to get clarity and so on within that. Um, We've got something called a coach, um, which is a dissociative technique that is based around a concept of coaching somebody. Um, it's a, you know multiple um, multiple parts stages of dissociation within this um, particular approach. No, it's not the same um, as the rewind technique uh, at all. It's more more. Uh, less observe, um, less of an observation, more of an, an intervention that we're carrying out with that. And also another dissociative technique, a polarity dissociation, which is based around the opposition of opposites, but is more an alert intervention as well for people who are not comfortable with using altered states. So we've got that element um, within the um, within the course. We've also got techniques for working with the past. Um, uh, a couple of um, ones, and those of you who know me, I'm rather passionate about inner child work. And we've included in the course an inner child approach for working with codependency, um, which is a very useful and powerful approach within that. But we also have a, uh, a very interesting uh, um, approach to regression that. Um, it's called the advanced pseudo regressive therapy approach, which not only it, it basically picks up. Somebody's got their microphone on. I can't see who it is. Um, so, okay, thank you. Um, so, the advanced pseudo regressive therapy approach includes pseudo orientation or hallucinated age progression. Um, it includes basically you're taking a person from different points, their past, present, and future, and using those those imagined personalities to guide somebody through a uh, 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 working through a traumatic experience. Highly dissociative. My favorite regression technique for this life regressions. Um, so it's a um, really useful approach there. Um, we also are bringing in paradoxical interventions. Basically, these are approaches that go contrary to a client's expectations of change. Um, they need to be used quite judiciously, um, but sometimes the, you know there's an element of shock approach within this, and we use this these approaches to destabilize and deconstruct, help a client deconstruct very rigid belief structures with how things will be. Um, you know, the client that um, keeps telling you, hey, guess what? Um, I don't think I'll ever get off. I don't think I'll ever get off. This is why I don't think I will. This is why I don't think I will. Um, and you can bring in quite interventions. For example, I might go in and say to that client, um, well, actually, no, I know you'll never get off. You'll never come un 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 unstuck. What I'm doing is using a matching. Uh, and again, this is done very judiciously with a client who I know is going to be able, I know what I'm doing with them because I'm challenging their negative mindset um, with something like that. If I say, no, I know you're not, then, oh, and then they will shift into the other direction. So 
Uh, we talk about the various paradoxical interventions there. We're also bringing in quantum psychology approaches and some understanding of quantum psychology. Um, so what is quantum psychology? Well, it's a bit of a mixing pot, really. You have Eastern philosophies um, that we bring in. We bring in the concepts within Western psychology. And also, because of the name, we bring in um, elements from quantum physics as well. So you've got Eastern philosophies, Western psychology, quantum physics mixing together in order to allow a client to gain new perspectives, to become more empowered. Um, and very much this fits in with part of this, um, this new thing that's um, this quantum psychology has been around for a while, but there is now this new focus within uh, psychotherapy, which is being termed the, notionally termed the fourth wave of psychotherapies. Um, and this is kind of more embracing the, um, uh, the spiritual humanistic type of approaches um, that we're seeing that people are starting to um, want to uh, uh, to get involved with, um, and they are you know, quite quite useful approaches to to be um, to be using. I, I use them an awful lot. Um, we're also not just focusing on on the negative stuff. We're also bringing in solution focused hypnotherapy into this course. Um, now, this is obviously based on solution focused therapy, something we teach um, as a, an added extra on all you know, our other um, EMDR and ego state therapy courses. But this one takes that approach and puts it into the hypnotherapy context. And yeah, we, with, with clients who are presenting with serious addiction issues and Quite often, um, you know, with with the trauma elements within that, bringing in something that creates a positive focus on positive outcomes, it, it stimulates that thing called the reticular activating system, our goal directed part set of structures um, within the brain that um, allow us to focus on positive outcomes. And through doing that, you tend to find that the automatic behaviors that lead them to more positive thoughts come in very little attention is paid to the problem now we're not saying go in and just do solution focused work solution focused work can be brought in every so often in the therapy sessions you're doing with a client so it doesn't always have to be on the negative um and as i say this um, reticular activating um, system kicking in uh, by paying attention to the solutions. The idea is it does stimulate the unconscious behaviors, the unconscious cognitive changes that basically guide the guy client in the right direction um, for good outcomes. And also within this, we're bringing in elements of positive psychology as well, building on uh, SFT. Um, and again, reinforcing that whole reticular activating um, system element. But what we're giving our exercises that we can give clients, and I use them an awful lot, my clients love them. Um, and also, you know, they never harms for us to do something for ourselves. So these are exercises that you can use within yourself as well. Um, give you a kind of breakdown of the course. We we have within the course four live weekends. Um, they're very practical oriented weekends. Um, we practice with demonstrations. We demonstrate everything that we do. There are five midweek one hour live lectures um that we present with regards to some of the theoretical aspects that we need to have um, knowledge of um we do record all live sessions so um not that if you miss a live session you'll never see it um we will record it um and you've got a chance to watch it afterwards i will say with the practice when we practice with a demo we'll record that but when people are paired up um in breakout rooms um we don't record within the breakout rooms you know confidentiality privacy etc um comes into there um 
obviously we bring an opportunity to discuss and the nice thing about the opportunity to discuss is that you get to uh, uh, look at your own particular um, presenting issues that your clients are bringing to you. Um, we also have our LSCCH learning zone, which is our Moodle system, um, which gives um, you know uh, other videos, other other elements that you can watch to build your learning. There are our recorded lectures in there, um, reading material, and so on, and. The exam, you know, it's not an onerous one. We've got continual pra um, continuous practical assessment as we're watching you um, practice, but also there is a, a, a relatively straightforward online MCQ um, that we present as well within that. Um, and the course is live virtual. And the beautiful thing about that is it allows us to explore therapy from a wide range of cultural perspectives. You know, it's all very well and good, me being stuck here in the UK and someone being in Singapore or Nigeria or Spain or Malaysia or wherever. Um, the nice thing about doing a live virtual course is we get to share, we get to show each other and explore cultural perspectives. You know, we live in a multicultural world and we can you know, in, in, in expand our cultural intelligence and expand our therapy skills and knowledge based around understanding other cultures. And this is what the really nice element of, the, of our courses brings in. Um, we don't just talk about, you know, it's a live virtual course. We don't just talk about the live virtual and how to do it. We'll also talk and give tips about those people who are working face to face as well. Um, and also, you know, once you qualify, there is also the opportunity to join the LSCCH Therapy Centre um, um, as well. Um, and just a reminder, it really is really open to um, qualified hypnotherapists on, on this one. So that kind of gives you an overview. I know just a couple of messages came in. Um, so, um, uh, so now's our chance to say any questions that you'd like to ask Charles and I any other ones above and beyond what uh, we've already discussed so uh, and I know um, we've got uh, uh, Risker in the background if you she's I know she's put her details in there if you've got any questions about the course itself want to receive more information absolutely please um contact her um and there are no other questions uh australian friends i know it's nine o'clock at night for you um it depends which part of australia you're in um and kl six o'clock london we're only 10 o'clock in the morning so so we're just starting our day uh, anyway, ah, um, anyone see you all later? Bye, Fiona. Bye. Um, so, uh, 6 p.m. in Malaysia. Yes. <laughs> okay, everyone. Well, look, it's been absolutely wonderful getting a chance to share with you. Um, hopefully, some of you will be with me next week on our free um, 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 uh, goal directed um, workshop or goal setting workshop um uh and on um riska will uh, contact you and let you know the dates of the course i at this particular moment i can't remember um but we've um, got your details we'll be able to send the dates so i think it's april coming up in april if i remember rightly um i know that i'm bound to teach the first weekend so uh, those of you coming on to that course, I'll see you then. Those of you coming next week, um, see you uh, at uh, Goal, Goal Directed on the workshop. So um, have a lovely, lovely remainder of your day. And um, I'm going to go and walk my dogs now. Okay. So I shall see you all later. Thank you, Charles. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. Julian. Thank you, Riska. Thank you, Shia. Thank you, anyone else I've forgotten to thank. So uh, take see you all later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.